We're in the book of John chapter 10. And we're in this series entitled Red Letters. And the theme of, or the, the title of this message, Can You Hear Me Now? And the whole idea of can you hear me now isn't can God you hear me now? But is God saying to us, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? And I just want to catch you guys all up because we impacted some of this last week, and I want to try to close it today, and I don't have a whole lot of time to do it. I have 14 minutes, so it's not probably going to happen, but I'm going to do my best. John chapter 10, verse 14, out of the New King James translation says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep. Let me say that again. This is Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep. And so... One of the things that I said last week is if there are good shepherds, then we also have to say that there are bad shepherds. If there are good leaders, there are bad leaders. And he says, I am the good shepherd. We understand our restoration life that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And not only is he our Savior, but he is also the pastor of this church. He is the head of this church. Right? He's the leader of this church. And he says, I'm the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice. And so we have a responsibility as disciples of Jesus Christ, as believers, and as people that have been saved and set free by the precious blood of Christ through the cross of Calvary. We know that we've been saved by grace. We know that we're not saved by works, but works is the byproduct Right? It's, 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 it should be the evidence of us being saved because we are saved by his grace. We're going to do good works. And it's not the other way around. We're not going to do good works to get saved. That's, that's an occultic idea. That's an old religious idea. There's nothing that we can do for our salvation. Jesus did it all. Can somebody say amen? And so he says, I'm the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I'm known by my own. As the Father knows me, so I even know the Father and lay down my life for the sheep and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, and them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Then we jump over to verse 27. He says, my sheep hear my voice. He says it again. And I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand, and I and my Father are one. Man, aren't you glad that there is nothing that this world can do to snatch you out of the love of the Father's hand? There's absolutely nothing or any circumstance that could separate you from the Father's hand and from the Father's love. And Jesus was saying this to a group of people that was walking with him, talking with him, conversing with him, even being a, a bit combative with him. And here's the hardcore truth. Jesus is teaching this and sharing this with people who know the Bible better than any, everybody else and yet they could not discern the very presence of God standing right in front of them and declaring that I am the Messiah. Now that's scary. That's scary. Because they said in verse 24, how do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And listen to what Jesus answers to them in verse 25. He said, I told you, and you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. And so he told them who he was. They are able to see all the works that he was doing, and yet they could not believe that he was the Messiah. And I wonder, and I said this last week, I'm just catching you up real quick. I wonder if so many of us are so hard of hearing what the Spirit of the Lord wants to say to us. Paul the Apostle reminds Timothy, the son in the faith, he says, Timothy, in chapter 4, verse 2 and 5, 
Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to fables. But you, you Timothy, you be watchful in all things and endure the afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. And so last week, we spent a little bit of time unpacking how people have itching ears and how they want to hear what they want to hear. They want their ears to be tickled by their perspective and their position. And they want something to fit their narrative or their feeling or their hurt. And so they start looking for people will side with their perspective, will side with their theology, that will side with what they believe is right, but according to Scripture is inaccurate. And these voices are telling us to believe this, to do that, to do this. But I want you to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying this morning. The Bible declares that faith comes by... Faith comes by... Faith comes by hearing what? The Word of God. The Word of God. Jesus declares, my sheep, those that belong to me, they hear me and they know it's my voice. They know how to distinguish my voice from false teachers. They know how to distinguish my voice from false preachers. They know how to distinguish my voice from false theology. They know how to hear my voice in a, a beyond what anything or anyone has to say. They hear my voice. I know them. And don't disqualify that God knows you. Because here's the God that created the heavens and the earth. Who's the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning, the end. The one that named every star in the galaxy. And every galaxy that is known and unknown to men. And he says, I know you. You're mine. In fact, not only do I know you. But before you were even born, I knew you. And set you apart for a purpose. Not your purpose, my purpose. Not Eddie's purpose, God's purpose. And so last week we ended with Jesus knows those who are his. And I find this so amazing because I'm blessed to be able to say that I know my father's voice. And I know how to distinguish the voice of the father be between him and the voice of the liar. And I know how to tell the difference between the voice of my father and the voice of a principality, a power, a ruler of darkness, or somebody who's trying to, sort, to, 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 to sow discord. I know the voice. I know God's voice. I know the father's voice. John 10, 3 says this. He says, and because the gatekeeper knows who he is, he opens the gate to let him in. And the sheep recognize the voice of the true shepherd. For he calls his own by name and leads them out, for they belong to him. Now listen, because I belong to the Father, I know that the Father is always going to lead me out. He's going to lead me out of the lie. Come on. He's going to lead me out of the turmoil. He's going to lead me out of the situation. He's going to lead me out of the circumstance. It might not feel good. I may suffer through it, but he's going to lead me out because I listen to the voice of the Father. And as long as I listen to his voice, I know at the end of the day, I'm going to be okay. And even if he doesn't let me be okay in this life, I know that this life will end and I will go to be I know the Father's voice, and because I know His voice, I'm not afraid of man's voice. John 10, 14 and 15 says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. And as the Father knows me, even so I am known by the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I, and I don't know if I told you this last week, but I love what John Piper said. I love John Piper's preaching. He said, to some degree, Jesus recognizes his own character and his disciples. He sees his own brand on us, on the sheep. He endears this to him. 
And I love the way John, just, Pastor John describes this. He says, he says, it's, it's like going to the airport and waiting for your beloved to get off of the plane. Now, I know, Robert, you work at the airport, so you see a lot of people get off and on the plane. Roxanne and I have been have traveled around pretty much, and when you get on a plane, my mind guys kind of goes like I'm looking for terrorists. You know, I'm just like, like I'm trying to pray, God, show me if he's in here. You know, it's the first thing I do. Actually, the first thing we do is lay hands on the plane and say, God, make this plane fly to its destination with no problems. And John Piper describes Jesus knowing his own this way. People are getting off the plane, and he sees that man, and he recognizes the man for who he is. He sees the woman, he recognizes the woman for who she is. He sees the family get off the plane. He knows the family that's getting off the plane. And he says, but then, but then you see your bride. You see the woman that you love. And in her eyes, you could, you could see the reflection of your love for her back to you. And she's endeared to you. So when you, when you see her getting off the plane, you, you start following her because you don't see anybody else. All you see is her. All you see is her. And you know her because she's your bride. And you know her because you're in covenant with her. And you know her because you're in love with her and she's in love with you. And he said, this is the way that Jesus knows the bride of Christ. This is the way that Jesus knows us. That amongst all the people, the eight plus billion people on the planet, when he sees you, he's like, I know, I, I know him. He's mine. I, I know her. I know that family. They're mine and I've been waiting. There you are. Come on, I'm right here. It's such a beautiful picture of how the Father knows us and I wish I had more time to go into depth to this but he delights in the knowing right he knows us because he saved us he knows us because he lives inside of every single one of us that have become the temple of the most high God he knows us because he sanctified us and set us apart for a reason and the reason has nothing to do with you as much as it has to do with him. He knows you. And because he knows you, you can hear his voice. My son, playing around other kids, if I were to raise my voice, none of the other kids would look, but my son knows my voice. He's like, that's my dad. Where is he? I know he's here. The Apostle Paul puts it like this in 2 Timothy 2.19. But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his. Aren't you glad that you know that you belong to Jesus? Aren't you glad that Jesus knows who you are? Come on, this is a precious gift to all the sheep. And it contains within it a profound personal relationship with a promise to eternal life. Because I know you, nobody's going to be able to snatch you out of my hands. Because I know you, I know you're going through stuff and it's okay. In this life, you're going to suffer. In this life, you're going to experience hardship. In, in this life, you're going to experience persecution. Come on, in this life, you're going to experience backstabbing. In this life, you're going to experience disloyalty. In this life, you're going to experience naysayers and haters and want to be players. Come on. In this life, you're going to experience all these things. If he said, don't fret, I know you. I know you. And because I know you, you're going to be okay. And so the question I would ask you is how is your hearing shaped? Because a lot of times our hearing is shaped by our hurt and we'll put the hurt as a filter in front of everything we're trying to comprehend and so a lot of our hearing is shaped by our hurt or a lot of our hearing is shaped 
by our narratives. A lot of our hearing is shaped by what we've experienced. But God wants to break through all those filters and tell you, and tell you very specifically that my sheep know my voice and they follow me. They follow me. John 8, 47 says, whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is because you are not of God. And over the last almost 30 years, I've tried to tune in as best possible based on what the scripture teaches me. And so I'm just going to give you a couple of practical ways that I believe we can tune in and learn to hear the Father's voice. Is this okay? Number one, and you're going to think this is so simple, this is so easy, this is so practical, but it's what most people won't do. The voice of Jesus is the word of God. Let me say that again. The voice of Jesus is the word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God what? It's God breathed. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God is equipping us to do good works. And we need to hear the voice of the Father in order to accomplish and pursue the work that He has planned for our lives. But how do you know what God is planning if you can't hear Him? How do you know what God is saying if you can't hear Him? And so let me remind you again that the voice of Jesus is the word of God. Here we see in John chapter 1, and I'll keep saying it because some of you are hard-headed like I was. Don't put your hand in the fire. You're going to get burnt. I don't know. Let me see. Right? In the beginning was the word. And the word was right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, who was the Word? Okay. Then the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Jesus is God. Everybody tracking with me? If in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, then the Word became flesh. It left the infinite to, the, to become intimate with us. Then we have to declare that Jesus, fully God and fully man, expressed himself to all of humanity so that he may come to, so they may come to know him in a very personal way. And he comes and he dies on a cross. He bears all of our sin because the only one who would be able to pay the price, the ultimate price, because there would be no sacrifice outside of God himself paying this price, goes to the cross, dies, takes our sin, and resurrects from the dead and restores a right relationship back together to his creation for those who would believe in him. But here's the problem. We love hearing the story, but we don't love knowing the story. We love hearing about the story, and we love hearing it in messages and podcasts, and YouTube, Spotify, but we don't understand the story the way God wants us to understand it. And so we forget that the Word 
was with God and the word was God and then the word became flesh and he dwelt among us and now he's at the right hand seated at the Father but God the Holy Spirit blew this very word inspired word into human beings to document all the instructions that you and I are to follow and so the word of God is the spirit of God as well here's where we fail we want everybody else to tell us what the word says but we don't go find out for ourselves here's where we fail where we fail is we don't go study it out for ourselves we go to itching ears and go what do you think what do you think what do you think go to the word God will speak to you because Jesus is the word of God let me say number two well let me just go back to number one anybody here who hasn't signed up to RLU you should sign up to RLU so that you could study the word of God know the word of God grow in the word of God and know how to respond and not react Here's the problem with too many people. You know how to react, but that's your flesh. You'll know how to respond when you know his word. Man, I wish I had another 40 minutes, Pastor Mitch. Because I want to unpack this. He's calling us into a place of restoration, but you won't know how if you don't know who. Come on. And he is the manifestation of the very word of God from the very beginning to 2,000 years ago. And today, the Holy Spirit still speaks. And he doesn't contradict himself. He doesn't contradict himself. Here's another thing you need to learn. There are too many people that know God's word but don't know Jesus. And you live like a, like a legalistic, pharisaical human being. Because you know what it says, but you don't know how to live it. Because you don't know him intimately. Oh, can I do that? Whatever that is. Whatever. He's calling you into a place of relationship, but you can't have relationship without knowing his word. You have to know his word, because if you know his word, you'll know him. That's a part of it. But you can't have this word without his Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to mess with some of you. Because some of us have our mindset, the word, the word, the word, push away the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, breathe that word. You can't push them away. They're one. They're one. You can't say the Holy Spirit or the presence of God or the gifts of the, of the Holy Spirit are different than the word. They're all one. They all come from the same place. So you can't have the Spirit without the Word. If you have the Spirit without the Word, you'll do stupid, goofy things. Trust me. I was birthed in a Pentecostal movement. And I love that I was. And I'm a Spirit-filled Christian. And I love that I am. Because the Holy Spirit fills me. I know that there are other people that are spirit-filled, but it's not the Holy Spirit. You need to hear this, church. Because if God breathed the Word into man to carry it throughout the millennia until He comes back for us, then you cannot have the Word without the Spirit either. Because you'll be a pharisaical, legalistic person that looks for fault in everything and everyone. And you quench the spirit wanting to move in you. So I learned this a long time ago. The word without the spirit, you're dried up. The spirit without the word, you'll do stupid stuff and you'll blow up. But when you live the way God intended you to live with the Spirit and the Word, you'll grow up. And I just feel like there needs to be some people that need to grow up in this house. And we're 
we're able to distinguish it because when people are just the word, the word, the word, it doesn't line up with what the Holy Spirit said. And when people are just the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit, it doesn't line up with what the Word said. And they're not going to contradict each other. They're in perfect alignment because they're one. We're the ones that get it all twisted and start to separate stuff. God's will is to be personally present. Here's my second thing. Okay, the Word. Can, can, look at somebody say, study your Bible. Come on, tell them, study your Bible. Look at somebody else and say, I'm signing you up for ROU. Go ahead, tell them. <laughs> It's okay if you're ignorant right now. Or if you're a little hood, ignorant. But God doesn't want you to stay ignorant of these things. Now that you know, you're held responsible for what you know. Because to them that know what to do and do it not to them, it is sin. So if you want to grow in the spirit, and you want to grow in your knowledge of him, you can't stay out of your word. Let me tell you, a YouTube video will never do for you what the Holy Spirit can do for you through the Word. Okay? Get your Bibles out and study your Word. Number two, number two, is, that, is this okay? Number two, recognize. And you need to know this because a lot of us come from Catholic backgrounds and we want to stay as far from God as we can because we don't want to get burned. Right? We're like, is God there? I'm not going there. He knows everything. <laughs> Guess what? He still does. Recognize that God created you to have a relationship with him. And here's what I'm going to say to a lot of you. You have more relationship with your Bible than you do with him. And what do I mean by that? I mean that you need to study your word. You need to dissect it. You need to unpack it. You, you need to study this to know how to defend it. But at the same time, you need to be able to go to the Father in prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal things to you that you haven't been able to discover on your own. And the Holy Spirit will do that for you every single time. He will. Why? Because you have a relationship with Him. He didn't die on a cross. He didn't leave all of heaven to become man and die on a rugged cross so that you would have a belief system in him to have a religion or a denomination he didn't die for any of that he died because he wanted to know you so that when he talked to you you would hear his voice and like good sheep when you heard Jesus bah, bah, you know you just where are you I want to be I love what I was reminded in worship today of what Moses said and Moses said, show me your glory. And God says, you can't see my glory and lift. And so God hides him in, in the cleft of a rock. And Moses, we know Moses isn't going to get it to go into the promised land. But, but Moses said this to God. Moses said, show me your glory. Because I want to be wherever you are. And if your presence isn't in the, in the promised land, that I'd rather stay out here in the desert to be in your presence. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. And so we have to know, Moses didn't say that, that latter part of it. But you need to know that God wants to have intimacy with you by or through relationship. And the only way that's been made possible is through being born again and accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can come to church as much as you want. Lift your hands, clap your hands. You can even come down here and sing and dance and sing along. That don't mean you're saved. That don't mean you're saved. Just because your mama goes to church doesn't mean you're saved. Just because your daddy goes to church doesn't mean you're saved. You need to have your own personal encounter with Jesus. God's will is to be personally present with you and speaking with you moment by moment as you go through life. Joshua knew this because God, the angel said in chapter 1 verse 9, haven't I commanded you be strong and courageous, be, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I want you to know that I've never, I've tried but my mind doesn't work this way. I've tried to set aside an hour to just pray and it, it doesn't work for me. In fact, I've 
feel bad when I can't pray for an hour. That I can't, <laughs> I can't listen to anybody for more than 10 or 15 minutes almost. This is just the way that I'm wired. And so I've come to a place in my own personal relationship with Jesus where I don't set aside an hour to be with him. I set aside all day to be with him. And so I just walk and talk with God all day long. All day long. I've been with Jesus. It has been a wonderful day. I walk and talk with him. I think sometimes people think I'm crazy. Because I'm like, are you sure? I'd be like, are you sure, God? No, I know that he's sure. I'm not sure. But I talk to him. I walk with him. I love him. I pray. I worship. I love what the psalmist in 17, oh my gosh, said, my steps have held to your paths. My feet have not stumbled. I call on you, my God, for you will answer me. Turn your ear to me and hear my prayer. Show me the wonders of your great love, you who say by your right hand and those who take refuge in you from their foes. I want to close with this. And I don't need the rest of the worship team to come up. I'm fine with just part. Um, one of the biggest problems we all have as Christians, and I'm just going to keep it as real as I can. We want to have a prayer life, but we don't understand how powerful that intimacy with God can be unless we communicate with the Father on a constant basis. You need to read your word. You need to study your word. You need to come to church and you need to worship in a corporate setting. You need to go do good works because that's what he's called us to do. But at the end of the day, if you're not praying, then the reality is you're not talking. And if you're not talking, he says you have not because you ask not. And this isn't about getting something from God. I'm just trying to describe to you that in order to have a relationship with the Father, you have to communicate with the Father. And one of the things that I've learned as a Christian, if, if I could just put it in these terms, is that more often than not, God says no more than he says yes. I love my children. I love my grandchildren. I, there's nothing I won't do for them. And they ask me for stuff all the time. And a lot of the times, I'll just go, no. Not because I don't love them, but it's because I love them that I say no to them. So if my children want to hang out with people that are unhealthy for them, I'm going to say no. Not because I don't love them, but because I love them, I want to keep them from them. So I'll say no. I'll say no when they want something that I can give them, but I believe that it'll turn them into a spoiled brat. And so I'll restrain from saying yes, and I'll just give them my no. Not because I don't love them. It's because I love them that I say no. And so no's from heaven are there to protect you more than they are to restrict you. And we don't like hearing no from God, but you need to learn this up front and need to know it now that more often than not, God is going to say no because he loves you, because he's trying to protect you, because he's trying to keep you. God, is she the one? No, you don't know. She's a hoochie on the downside. God, do you want me to have this job? No, because it's going to pull you away from me. God, do you want me to go to this school? No, because those friends are going to keep you from my presence and they're going to lead you astray. God, I want this house. And God says, no, you're going to make that house your idol and I shall have no other idols before me. God, do you want me to live blessed and he says no because if I bless you your head will blow up and you'll leave me so my no is to protect you oh but when he says yes let me teach you something right now church your praise and your worship needs to be just as vibrant in his no than when it's a yes. It needs to be just as passionate, just as loving, just as all out and surrendered over his no's as much as when he says yes. But here's the scary part, John 10, 42. If God were your father, this is Jesus, you would love me. For I have come here from God, and I have not come on my own. God sent me. 
why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his truth. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any one of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, then why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. And the reason you don't hear is you don't belong to God. That frightens me, not for me, but for some of you. Because I know my father. I hear his voice. And I follow him. And so if I could have every head bowed and every eye closed in reverence to the Lord.